course, Tommy cannot always be producing plays under fire, but while in rest billets, he has numerous other ways of amusing himself. He is a great gambler, but never plays for large stakes. Generally, in each company, you will find a regular Canfield. This man banks nearly all the games of chance and is an undisputed authority on the rules of gambling. Whenever there is an argument among the Tommies about some uncertain point as to whether Houghton is entitled to Watkins sixpence, the matter is taken to the recognized authority and his decision is final. The two most popular games are Crown and Anchor and House. The paraphernalia used in Crown and Anchor consists of a piece of canvas two feet by three feet. This is divided into six equal squares. In these squares are painted a club, diamond, heart, spade, crown, and an anchor, one device to a square. There are three dice used. Each dice marked the same as the canvas. The banker sets up his gambling outfit in the corner of a billet and starts ballyhooing until a crowd of Tommies gather around. Then the game starts. The Tommies place bets on the squares, the crown or anchor being played the most. The banker then rolls his three dice and collects or pays out as the case may be. If you play the crown and one shows up on the dice, you get even money. If two show up, you receive two to one, and if three, three to one. If the crown does not appear and you have bet on it, you lose, and so on. The percentage for the banker is large if every square is played, but if the crowd is partial to, say, two squares, he has to trust to luck. The banker generally wins. The game of house is very popular also. It takes two men to run it. This game consists of numerous squares of cardboard containing three rows of numbers, five numbers to a row. The numbers run from one to 90. Each card has a different combination. The French estaminets in the villages are open from 11 in the morning until one in the afternoon in accordance with army orders. After dinner, the Tommies congregate at these places to drink French beer at a penny, a glass and play house. As soon as the establishment is sufficiently crowded, the proprietors of the house game get busy and, as they term it, form a school. This consists of going around and selling cards at a franc each. If they have ten in the school, the backers of the game deduct two francs for their trouble and the winner gets eight francs. Then the game starts. Each buyer places his card before him on the table, first breaking up matches into fifteen pieces. One of the backers of the game has a small cloth bag in which are ninety cardboard squares, each with a number printed thereon from one to ninety. He raps on the table and cries out, Eyes down, my lucky lads! All noise ceases and everyone is attention. The croupier places his hand in the bag and draws forth a numbered square and immediately calls out the number. The man who owns the card with that particular number on it covers the square with a match. The one who covers the fifteen numbers on his card first shouts, House. The other backer immediately comes over to him, and verifies the card, by calling out the numbers thereon to the man with the bag. As each number is called, he picks it out of the ones picked from the bag and says, Right. If the count is right, he shouts, House correct? Pay the lucky gentleman and sell him a card for the next school. The lucky gentleman generally buys one unless he has a Semitic trace in his veins. Then another collection is made, a school formed, and they carry on with the game. The caller out has many nicknames for the numbers such as Kelly's Eye for one. Legs 11 for 11, clickety-click for 66, or top of the house, meaning 90. The game is honest and quite enjoyable. Sometimes you have 14 numbers on your card covered, and you are waiting for the 15th to be called. In an imploring voice, you call out, Come on, Watkins, chum, I'm sweating on Kelly's eye. Watkins generally replies, Well, keep out of a draft, you'll catch cold. Another game is pontoon played with cards. It is the same as our blackjack or 21. A card game called Brag is also popular. Using a casino deck, the dealer deals each player three cards. It is similar to our poker, except for the fact that you only use three cards and cannot draw. The deck is never shuffled until a man shows three of a kind, or a prile as it is called. The value of the hands are high card, a pair, a run, a flush, or three of a kind, or prile. The limit is generally a penny, so it is hard to win a fortune. The next in popularity is a card game called Nap. It is well named. Every time I played it, I went to sleep. Whist and solo whist are played by the highbrows of the company. When the gamblers tire of all other games, they try banker and broker. I spent a week trying to teach some of the Tommies how to play poker, 
but because I won 35 francs, they declared that they didn't fancy the game. Tommy plays few card games. The general run never heard of poker, euchre, seven up, or pinnacle. They have a game similar to pinnacle called Royal Bezique, but few know how to play it. And generally, there are two decks of cards in a section, and in a short time, they are so dog eared and greasy, you can hardly tell the Ace of Spades from the Ace of Hearts. The owners of these decks sometimes condescend to lend them after much coaxing. So you see, Mr. Atkins has his fun mixed in with his hardships. And contrary to popular belief, the rank and file of the British Army in the trenches is one big happy family. Now in Virginia at school, I was fed on Old McGuffey's primary reader, which gave me an opinion of an Englishman about equal to a 76-minute man's backed up by a Sin Finer's. But I found Tommy to be the best of mates and a gentleman through and through. He never thinks of knocking his officers. If one makes a costly mistake and Tommy pays with his blood, there is no general condemnation of the officer. He is just pitied. It is exactly the same as it was with the Light Brigade at Balaclava, to say nothing of Gallipoli, Neuve-Chapelle, and Luz. Personally, I remember a little incident where twenty of us were sent on a trench raid, only two of us returning, but I will tell this story later on. I said it was a big happy family and so it is, but as in all happy families, there are servants. So in the British Army there are also servants, officers' servants, or O.S., as they are termed. In the American Army the common name for them is dog robbers. From a controversy in the English papers, Winston Churchill made the statement, as far as I can remember, that the officers' servants in the British forces totaled nearly 200,000. He claimed that this removed 200,000 exceptionally good and well-trained fighters from the actual firing line, claiming that the officers, when selecting a man for servant's duty, generally picked the man who had been out the longest and knew the ropes. But from my observation, I find that a large percentage of the servants do go over the top, but behind the lines, they very seldom engage in digging parties, fatigues, parades, or drills. This work is as necessary as actually engaging in an attack. Therefore, I think that it would be safe to say that the all-round work of the 200,000 is about equal to 50,000 men who are on straight military duties. In numerous instances, officers' servants hold the rank of lance corporals, and they assume the same duties and authority of a butler, the one stripe giving him precedence over the other servants. There are lots of amusing stories told of O.S. One day, one of our majors went into the servant's billet and commenced blinding at them saying that his horse had no straw, and that he personally knew that straw had been issued for this purpose. He called the lance corporal to account. The corporal answered, Blind me, sir. The straw was issued, but there wasn't enough left over from the servants' beds. In fact, we had to use some of the A to help out, sir. It is needless to say that the servants dispensed with their soft beds that particular night. Nevertheless, it is not the fault of the individual officer, it is just the survival of a quaint old English custom. You know an Englishman cannot be changed in a day. But the average English officer is a good sport he will sit on a fire step and listen respectfully to Private Jones's theory of the way the war should be conducted. This war is gradually crumbling the once unsurmountable wall of caste. You would be convinced of this if you could see King George go among his men on an inspecting tour under fire or pause before a little wooden cross in some shell-tossed field with tears in his eyes as he reads the inscription, and a little later perhaps bend over a wounded man on a stretcher, patting him on the head. More than once in a hospital I have seen a titled Red Cross nurse fetching and caring for a wounded soldier, perhaps the one who in civil life delivered the coal at her back door. Today she does not. Shrink from lighting his fag or even washing his grimy body. Tommy admires Albert of Belgium because he is not a pusher of men, he leads them. With him, it's not a case of, take that trench, it is come on, and we will take it. It is amusing to notice the different characteristics of the Irish, Scotch, and English soldiers. The Irish and Scotch are very impetuous, especially when it comes to bayonet fighting, while the Englishman, though a trifle slower, thoroughly does his bit. He is more methodical and has the grip of a bulldog on a captured position. He is slower to think. That is the reason why he never knows when he is licked. Twenty minutes before going over the top, the English Tommy will sit on the fire step and thoroughly examine the mechanism of his rifle to see that it is in working order and will fire properly. 
After this examination, he is satisfied and ready to meet the Boches. But the Irishman or Scotchman sits on the fire step, his rifle with bayonet fixed between his knees, the butt of which perhaps is sinking into the mud. The bolt couldn't be opened with a team of horses, it is so rusty. But he spits on his sleeve and slowly polishes his bayonet. When this is done, he also is ready to argue with Fritz. It is not necessary to mention the Colonials, the Canadians, Australians, and New Zealanders. The whole world knows what they have done for England. The Australian and New Zealander is termed the Anzac, taking the name from the first letters of their official designation, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. Tommy divides the German army into three classes according to their fighting abilities. They rank as follows, Prussians, Bavarians, and Saxons. When up against a Prussian regiment, it is a case of keep your napper below the parapet and duck. A bang-bang all the time and a war is on. The Bavarians are little better, but the Saxons are fairly good sports and are willing occasionally to behave as gentlemen and take it easy, but you cannot trust any of them over long. At one point of the line, the trenches were about 32 yards apart. This sounds horrible, but in fact it was easy, because neither side could shell the enemy's front-line trench for fear shells would drop into their own. This eliminated artillery fire. In these trenches, when up against the Prussians and Bavarians, Tommy had a hot time of it. But when the Saxons took over, it was a picnic. They would yell across that they were Saxons and would not fire. Both sides would sit on the parapet and carry on a conversation. This generally consisted of Tommy telling them how much he loved the Kaiser, while the Saxons informed Tommy that King George was a particular friend of theirs and hoped that he was doing nicely. When the Saxons were to be relieved by Prussians or Bavarians, they would yell this information across no man's land, and Tommy would immediately tumble into his trench and keep his head down. If an English regiment was to be relieved by the wild Irish, Tommy would tell the Saxons, and immediately a volley of Donner und Blitzens could be heard, and it was Fritz's turn to get a crick in his back from stooping, and the people in Berlin would close their windows. Usually when an Irishman takes over a trench just before a stand down in the morning, he sticks his rifle over the top aimed in the direction of Berlin and engages in what is known as the Mad Minute. This consists of firing 15 shots in a minute. He is not aiming at anything in particular just sends over each shot with a prayer, hoping that one of his strays will get some poor unsuspecting Fritz in the napper, hundreds of yards behind the lines. It generally does. That's the reason the Boches hate the man from Aaron's Isle. The Saxons, though better than the Prussians and Bavarians, have a nasty trait of treachery in their makeup. At one point of the line where the trenches were very close, a stake was driven into the ground midway between the hostile lines. At night, when it was his turn, Tommy would crawl to this stake and attach some London papers to it, while at the foot he would place tins of bully beef fags, sweets, and other delicacies that he had received from Blighty in the ever-looked-for parcel. Later on, Fritz would come out and get these luxuries. The next night, Tommy would go out to see what Fritz had put into his stocking. The donation generally consisted of a paper from Berlin telling who was winning the war, some tinned sausages, cigars, and occasionally a little beer. But a funny thing... Tommy never returned with the beer unless it was inside of him. His platoon got a whiff of his breath one night, and the offending Tommy lost his job. One night a young English sergeant crawled to the stake, and as he tried to detach the German paper a bomb exploded and mangled him horribly. Fritz had set his trap and gained another victim, which was only one more black mark against him in the book of this war. From that time on diplomatic relations were severed. Returning to Tommy, I think his spirit is best shown in the questions he asks. It is never who is going to win, but always how long will it take. We were swimming in money from the receipts of our theatrical venture and had forgotten all about the war, when an order came through that our brigade would again take over their sector of the line. The day that these orders were issued, our captain assembled the company and asked for volunteers to go to the machine gun school at St. Omer. I volunteered and was accepted. Sixteen men from our brigade left for the course in machine gunnery. This course lasted two weeks, and we rejoined our unit and were assigned to the brigade machine gun company. It almost broke my heart to leave my company mates. The gun we used was the Vickers Light 303, water-cooled. I was still a member of the suicide club, having jumped from the frying pan into the fire. I was assigned to Section 1, gun number 2, 
and the first time in took position in the front-line trench. During the day, our gun would be dismounted on the fire step, ready for instant use. We shared a dugout with the Lewis gunners. At Stand 2, we would mount our gun on the parapet and go on watch beside it until Stand down in the morning, then the gun would be dismounted and again placed in readiness on the fire step. We did eight days in the front-line trench without anything unusual happening outside of the ordinary trench routine. On the night that we were to carry out, a bombing raid against the German lines was pulled off. This raiding party consisted of 60 company men, 16 bombers, and four Lewis machine guns with their crews. The raid took the Boches by surprise and was a complete success, the party bringing back 21 prisoners. The Germans must have been awfully sore because they turned loose a barrage of shrapnel with a few minis and whiz-bangs intermixed. The shells were dropping into our front line like hailstones. To get even, we could have left the prisoners in the fire trench, in charge of the men on guard, and let them click Fritz's strafing. But Tommy does not treat prisoners that way. Five of them were brought into my dugout and turned over to me so that they would be safe from the German fire. In the candlelight, they looked very much shaken, nerves gone and chalky faces, with the exception of one, a great big fellow. He looked very much at ease. I liked him from the start. I got out the rum jar and gave each a nip and passed around some fags, the old reliable woodbines. The other prisoners looked their gratitude, but the big fellow said in English, Thank you, sir. The rum is excellent and I appreciate it also your kindness. He told me his name was Carl Schmidt, of the 66th Bavarian Light Infantry, that he had lived six years in New York, knew the city better than I did, had been to Coney Island and many of our ball games. He was a regular fan. I couldn't make him believe that Hans Wagner wasn't the best ball player in the world. From New York he had gone to London, where he worked as a waiter in the Hotel Russell. Just before the war he went home to Germany to see his parents. The war came, and he was conscripted. He told me he was very sorry to hear that London was in ruins from the Zeppelin raids. I could not convince him otherwise, for hadn't he seen moving pictures in one of the German cities of St. Paul's Cathedral in ruins? I changed the subject because he was so stubborn in his belief. It was my intention to try and pump him for information as to the methods of the German snipers, who had been causing us trouble in the last few days. I broached the subject and he shut up like a clam. After a few minutes he very innocently said, German snipers get paid rewards for killing the English. I eagerly asked, what are they? He answered, for killing or wounding an English private, the sniper gets one mark. For killing or wounding an English officer, he gets five marks. But if he kills a red cap or English general, the sniper gets 21 days tied to the wheel of a limber as punishment for his carelessness. Then he paused, waiting for me to bite, I suppose. I bit all right and asked him why the sniper was. Punished for killing an English general. With a smile, he replied, Well, you see, if all the English generals were killed, there would be no one left to make costly mistakes. I shut him up. He was getting too fresh for a prisoner. After a while, he winked at me, and I winked back. Then the escort came to take the prisoners to the rear. I shook hands and wished him the best of luck and a safe journey to Blighty. I liked that prisoner. He was a fine fellow, had an iron cross, too. I advised him to keep it out of sight or some Tommy would be sending it home to his girl in Blighty as a souvenir. One dark and rainy night while on guard, we were looking over the top from the fire step of our front-line trench when we heard a noise immediately in front of our barbed wire. The sentry next to me challenged, Halt, who comes there? and brought his rifle to the aim. His challenge was answered in German. A captain in the next traverse climbed upon the sandbagged parapet to investigate. A brave but foolhardly deed. Crack went a bullet and he tumbled back into the trench with a hole through his stomach and died a few minutes later. A lance corporal in the next platoon was so enraged at the captain's death that he chucked a Mills bomb in the direction of the noise with the shouted warning to us, Duck your nappers, my lucky lads. A sharp dynamite report, a flare in front of us, and then silence. We immediately sent up two star shells and in their light could see two dark forms lying on the ground close to our wire. A sergeant and four stretcher bearers went out in front and soon returned, carrying two limp bodies. Down in the dugout in the flickering light of three candles we saw that they were two German officers, one a captain and the other an unteroffizier, a rank one grade higher than a sergeant major, but below the grade of a lieutenant. 
The captain's face had been almost completely torn away by the bomb's explosion. The hunter of Fisher was alive, breathing with difficulty. In a few minutes he opened his eyes and blinked in the glare of the candles. The pair had evidently been drinking heavily, for the alcohol fumes were sickening and completely pervaded the dugout. I turned away in disgust, hating to see a man cross the Great Divide full of booze. One of our officers could speak German and he questioned the dying man. In a faint voice, interrupted by frequent hiccups, the underofficier told his story. There had been a drinking bout among the officers in one of the German dugouts, the main beverage being champagne. With a drunken leer, he informed us that champagne was plentiful on their side, and that it did not cost them anything either. About seven that night the conversation had turned to the contemptible English, and the captain had made a wager that he would hang his cap on the English barbed wire to show his contempt for the English sentries. The wager was accepted. At eight o'clock the captain and he had crept out into no man's land to carry out this wager. They had gotten about halfway across when the drink took effect and... The captain fell asleep. After about two hours of vain attempts, the underofficier had at last succeeded in waking the captain, reminded him of his bet, and warned him that he would be the laughingstock of the officer's mess if he did not accomplish his object. But the captain was trembling all over and insisted on returning to the German lines. In the darkness they lost their bearings and crawled toward the English trenches. They reached the barbed wire and were suddenly challenged by our sentry. Being too drunk to realize that the challenge was in English, the captain refused to crawl back. Finally, the unterofficier convinced his superior that they were in front of the English wire. Realizing this too late, the captain drew his revolver and with a muttered curse crept blindly toward our trench. His bullet no doubt killed our captain. Then the bomb came over and there he was, dying, and a good job too, we thought. The captain dead? Well, his men wouldn't weep at the news. Without giving us any further information, the unterofficier died. We searched the bodies for identification discs, but they had left everything behind before starting on their foolhardy errand. Next afternoon we buried them in our little cemetery apart from the graves of the Tommies. If you ever go into that cemetery, you will see two little wooden crosses in the corner of the cemetery set away from the rest, as they read, Captain, German Army, died, 1916, unknown. The next evening we were relieved by the This Brigade and once again returned to rest billets. Upon arriving at these billets, we were given 24 hours in which to clean up. I had just finished getting the mud from my uniform when the orderly sergeant informed me that my name was in orders for leave and that I was to report to the orderly room in the morning for orders, transportation, and rations. I nearly had a fit, hustled about, packing up, filling my pack with souvenirs such as shell heads, dud bombs, nose caps, shrapnel balls, and a Prussian guardsman's helmet. In fact, before I turned in that night, I had everything ready to report at the orderly room at nine the next morning. I was the envy of the whole section, swanking around, telling of the good time I was going to have, the places I would visit, and the real old English beer I intended to guzzle. Sort of rubbed it into them, because they all do it, and now that it was my turn, I took pains to get my own back. At nine, I reported to the captain, receiving my travel order and pass. He asked me how much money I wanted to draw. I glibly answered, Three hundred francs, sir. He just as glibly handed me one hundred. Reporting at brigade headquarters, with my pack weighing a ton, I waited, with forty others, for the adjutant to inspect us. After an hour's wait, he came out. Must have been sore, because he wasn't going with us. The quartermaster sergeant issued us two days' rations in a little white canvas ration bag, which we tied to our belts. Then two motor lorries came along, and we piled in, laughing, joking, and in the best of spirits. We even loved the Germans, we were feeling so happy. Our journey to seven days' bliss in Blighty had commenced. The ride in the lorry lasted about two hours. By this time we were covered with fine white dust from the road, but didn't mind, even if we were nearly choking. Photo. Field postcard issued once a week to the Tommies. At the railroad station at Piede. We reported to an officer who had a white band around his arm, which read RTO. Royal Transportation Officer. To us, this officer was Santa Claus. The sergeant in charge showed him our orders. He glanced through them and said, Make yourselves comfortable on the platform and don't leave. The train is liable to be along in five minutes, or five hours. 
It came in five hours, a string of eleven matchboxes on big high wheels, drawn by a dinky little engine with the con. These matchboxes were cattle cars, on the sides of which was painted the old familiar sign, OMS 40 Chevaux 8. The RTO stuck us all into one car. We didn't care, it was as good as a Pullman to us. Two days we spent on that train bumping, stopping, jerking ahead, and sometimes sliding back. At three stations we stopped long enough to make some tea, but were unable to wash, so when we arrived at B, where we were to embark for Blighty, we were as black as Turcos, and with our unshaven faces, we looked like a lot of tramps. Though tired out, we were happy. We had packed up preparatory to detraining when a RTO held up his hand for us to stop where we were and came over. This is what he said. Boys, I'm sorry, but orders have just been received cancelling all leave. If you had been three hours earlier, you would have gotten away. Just stay in that train, as it is going back. Rations will be issued to you for your return journey to your respective stations. Beastly rotten, I know. Then he left. A dead silence resulted. Then men started to curse, threw their rifles on the floor of the car. Others said nothing, seemed to be stupefied, while some had the tears running down their cheeks. It was a bitter disappointment to all. How we blinded at the engineer of that train, it was all his fault, so we reasoned. Why hadn't he speeded up a little or been on time, then we would have gotten off before the order arrived. Now it was no blighty for us. That return journey was misery to us, I just can't describe it. When we got back to rest billets, we found that our brigade was in the trenches, another agreeable surprise, and that an attack was contemplated. Seventeen of the forty-one will never get another chance to go on leave. They were killed in the attack. Just think if that train had been on time, those seventeen would still be alive. I hate to tell you how I was kidded by the boys when I got back, but it was good and plenty. Our machine gun company took over their part of the line at seven o'clock, the night after I returned from my near leave. At 3.30 the following morning, three waves went over and captured the first and second German trenches. The machine gunners went over with the fourth wave to consolidate the captured line, or dig in, as Tommy calls it. Crossing no man's land without clicking any casualties, we came to the German trench and mounted our guns on the Parados of same. I never saw such a mess in my life. Bunches of twisted barbed wire lying about, shell holes everywhere, trench all bashed in, parapets gone and dead bodies. Why that ditch was full of them, theirs and ours. It was a regular morgue. Some were mangled horribly from our shell fire, while others were wholly or partly buried in the mud, the result of shell explosions caving in the walls of the trench. One dead German was lying on his back, with a rifle sticking straight up in the air, the bayonet of which was buried to the hilt in his chest. Across his feet lay a dead English soldier with a bullet hole in his forehead. This Tommy must have been killed just as he ran his bayonet through the German. Our rifles and equipment were scattered about, and occasionally a steel helmet could be seen sticking out of the mud. At one point, just in the entrance to a communication trench, was a stretcher. On this stretcher, a German was lying with a white bandage around his knee. Near to him lay one of the stretcher bearers, the red cross on his arm covered with mud and his helmet filled with blood and brains. Close by, sitting up against the wall of the trench, with head resting on his chest, was the other stretcher bearer. He seemed to be alive, the posture was so natural and easy, but when I got closer I could see a large, jagged hole in his temple. The three must have been killed by the same shell burst. The dugouts were all smashed in, and knocked about, big square-cut timbers splintered into bits, walls caved in, and entrances choked. Tommy, after taking a trench, learns to his sorrow that the hardest part of the work is to hold it. In our case, this proved to be so. The German artillery and machine guns had us taped, ranged for fair. It was worth your life to expose yourself an instant. Don't think for a minute that the Germans were the only sufferers. We were clicking casualties so fast that you needed an adding machine to keep track of them. Did you ever see one of the steam shovels at work on the Panama Canal? Well, it would look like a hen scratching alongside of a Tommy digging in while under fire. You couldn't see daylight through the clouds of dirt from his shovel. After losing three out of six men of our crew, we managed to set up our machine gun. One of the legs of the tripod was resting on the chest of a half-buried body. When the gun was firing, it gave the impression that the body was breathing. This was caused by the excessive vibration. Three or four feet down the trench, about three feet from the ground, a foot was protruding from the earth. 
We knew it was a German by the black leather boot. One of our crew used that foot to hang extra bandoliers of ammunition on. This man always was a handy fellow, made use of little points that the ordinary person would overlook. The Germans made three counterattacks which we repulsed, but not without heavy loss on our side. They also suffered severely from our shell and machine gun fire. The ground was spotted with their dead and dying. The next day things were somewhat quieter, but not quiet enough to bury the dead. We lived, ate, and slept in that trench with the unburied dead for six days. It was awful to watch their faces become swollen and discolored. Towards the last, the stench was fierce. What got on my nerves the most was that foot sticking out of the dirt. It seemed to me, at night in the moonlight, to be trying to twist. Around. Several times this impression was so strong that I went to it and grasped it in both hands, to see if I could feel a movement. I told this to the man who had used it for a hat rack just before I lay down for a little nap, as things were quiet, and I needed a rest pretty badly. When I woke up the foot was gone. He had cut it off with our chainsaw out of the spare parts box and had plastered the stump over with mud. During the next two or three days before we were relieved I missed that foot dreadfully, seemed as if I had suddenly lost a chum. I think the worst thing of all was to watch the rats at night and sometimes in the day, run over and play about among the dead. Near our gun, right across the parapet, could be seen the body of a German lieutenant, the head and arms of which were hanging into our trench. The man who had cut off the foot used to sit and carry on a one-sided conversation with this officer, used to argue and point out why Germany was in the wrong. During all of this monologue I never heard him say anything out of the way anything that would have hurt the officer's feelings had he been alive. He was square all right, wouldn't even take advantage of a dead man in an argument. To civilians this must seem dreadful, but out here one gets so used to awful sights that it makes no impression. In passing a butcher shop you are not shocked by seeing a dead turkey hanging from a hook. Well, in France a dead body is looked upon from the same angle. But nevertheless, when our six days were up we were tickled to death to be relieved. Our machine gun company lost 17 killed and 31 wounded in that little local affair of straightening the line, while the other companies clicked it worse than we did. After the attack we went into reserve billets for six days and on the seventh once again we were in rest billets. Soon after my arrival in France, in fact from my enlistment, I had found that in the British Army discipline is very strict. One has to be very careful in order to stay on the narrow path of government virtue. There are about seven million ways of breaking the king's regulations. To keep one, you have to break another. The worst punishment is death by a firing squad or up against the wall, as Tommy calls it. This is for desertion, cowardice, mutiny, giving information to the enemy, destroying or willfully wasting ammunition, looting, rape, robbing the dead, forcing a safeguard, striking a superior, etc. Then comes the punishment of 64 days in the front-line trench without relief. During this time you have to engage in all raids, working parties in no man's land, and every hazardous undertaking that comes along. If you live through the 64 days you are indeed lucky. This punishment is awarded where there is a doubt as to the willful guilt of a man who has committed an offense punishable by death. Then comes the famous field punishment number here. Tommy has nicknamed it crucifixion. It means that a man is spread eagled on a limber wheel, two hours a day for twenty-one days. During this time he only gets water, bully beef, and biscuits for his chow. You get crucified for repeated minor offenses. Next in order is field punishment number two. This is confinement in the clink, without blankets, getting water, bully beef, and biscuits for rations, and doing all the dirty work that can be found. This may be for twenty-four hours or twenty days, according to the gravity of the offense. Then comes pack drill, or defaulter's parade. This consists of drilling, mostly at the double, for two hours with full equipment. Tommy hates this, because it is hard work. Sometimes he fills his pack with straw to lighten it, and sometimes he gets caught. If he gets caught, he grouses. At everything in general for twenty-one days, from the vantage point of a limber wheel. Next comes CB, meaning confined to barracks. This consists of staying in billets or barracks for twenty-four hours to seven days. You also get an occasional defaulter's parade and dirty jobs around the quarters. The sergeant major keeps what is known as the crime sheet. When a man commits an offense, he is crimed. That is, his name, number, and offense is entered on the crime sheet. 
Next day at 9 a.m., he goes to the orderly room before the captain, who either punishes him with CB or sends him before the OC, officer commanding battalion. The captain of the company can only award CB. Tommy many a time has thanked the king for making that provision in his regulations. To gain the title of a smart soldier, Tommy has to keep clear of the crime sheet, and you have to be darned smart to do it. I have been on it a few times, mostly for Yankee impudence. During our stay of two weeks in rest billets, our captain put us through a course of machine gun drills, trying out new stunts and theories. After parades were over, our guns crews got together and also tried out some theories of their own in reference to handling guns. These courses had nothing to do with the advancement of the war, consisted mostly of causing tricky jams in the gun, and then the rest of the crew would endeavor to locate as quickly as possible the cause of the stoppage. This amused them for a few days, and then things came to a standstill. One of the boys on my gun claimed that he could play a tune while the gun was actually firing, and demonstrated this fact one day on the target range. We were very enthusiastic and decided to become musicians. After constant practice, I became quite expert in the tune entitled, All Conductors Have Big Feet. When I had mastered this tune, our two weeks rest came to an end and once again we went up the line and took over the sector in front of G. Wood. At this point the German trenches ran around the base of a hill, on the top of which was a dense wood. This wood was infested with machine guns, which used to traverse our lines at will and sweep the streets of a little village where we were billeted while in reserve. There was one gun in particular which used to get our goats. It had the exact range of our elephant dugout entrance, and every evening, about the time rations were being brought up, its bullets would knock up the dust on the road. More than one Tommy went west or to Blighty by running into them. This gun got our nerves on edge, and Fritz seemed to know it because he never gave us an hour's rest. Our reputation as machine gunners was at stake. We tried various ruses to locate and put this gun out of action, but each one proved to be a failure, and Fritz became a worse nuisance than ever. He was getting fresher and more careless every day, took all kinds of liberties with us, thought he was invincible. Then one of our crew got a brilliant idea and we were all enthusiastic to put it to the test. Here was his scheme. When firing my gun, I was to play my tune and Fritz, no doubt, would fall for it, try to imitate me as an added insult. This gunner and two others would try, by the sound, to locate Fritz and his gun. After having got the location, they would mount two machine guns in trees in a little dump of woods to the left of our cemetery. And while Fritz was in the middle of his lesson, would open up and trust to luck. By our calculations, it would take at least a week to pull off the stunt. If Fritz refused to swallow our bait, it would be impossible to locate his special gun. And that's the one we were after, because they all sound alike. A slow pup, pup, pup. Our prestige was hanging by a thread. In the battalion, we had to endure all kinds of insults and fresh remarks as to our ability in silencing Fritz. Even to the battalion, that German gun was a sore spot. Next day, Fritz opened up as usual. I let him fire away for a while and then butted in with my pup, 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 pup. I kept this up quite a while, used two belts of ammunition. Fritz had stopped firing to listen. Then he started in. Sure enough, he had fallen for our game. His gun was trying to imitate mine, but at first he made a horrible mess of that tune. Again, I butted in with a few bars and stopped. Then he tried to copy what I had played. He was a good sport, all right, and because his bullets were going away over our heads must have been firing into the air. I commenced to feel friendly toward him. This duet went on for five days. Fritz was a good pupil and learned rapidly. In fact, got better than his teacher. I commenced to feel jealous. When he had completely mastered the tune, he started sweeping the road again and we clicked it worse than ever. But he signed his death warrant by doing so, because my friendship turned to hate. Every time he fired, he played that tune, and we danced. The boys in the battalion gave us the ha-ha. They weren't in on our little frame-up. The originator of the ruse and the other two gunners had Fritz's location taped to the minute. They mounted their two guns and also gave me the range. The next afternoon was set for the grand finale. Our three guns with different elevations had their fire so arranged that, opening up together, their bullets would suddenly drop on Fritz like a hailstorm. About three the next day, Fritz started pup-pupping that tune. I blew a sharp blast on a whistle. It was the signal agreed upon. We turned loose 
and Fritz's gun suddenly stopped in the middle of a bar. We had cooked his goose and our ruse had worked. After firing two belts each to make sure of our job, we hurriedly dismounted our guns and took cover in the dugout. We knew what to expect soon. We didn't have to wait long. Three salvos of whiz-bangs came over from Fritz's artillery, a further confirmation that we had sent that musical machine gunner on his westward-bound journey. That gun never bothered us again. We were the heroes of the battalion. Our captain congratulated us, said it was a neat piece of work, and consequently, we were all puffed up over the stunt. There are several ways Tommy uses to disguise the location of his machine gun and get his range. Some of the most commonly used stunts are as follows. At night, when he mounts his gun over the top of his trench and wants to get the range of Fritz's trench, he adopts the method of what he terms getting the sparks. This consists of firing bursts from his gun until the bullets hit the German barbed wire. He can tell when they are cutting the wire, because a bullet when it hits a wire throws out a blue electric spark. Machine gun fire is very damaging to wire and causes many a wiring party to go out at night when it is quiet to. Repair the damage. To disguise the flare of his gun at night when firing, Tommy uses what is called a flare protector. This is a stovepipe arrangement which fits over the barrel casing of the gun and screens the sparks from the right and left, but not from the front. So Tommy, always resourceful, adopts this scheme. About three feet or less in front of the gun, he drives two stakes into the ground about five feet apart. Across these stakes, he stretches a curtain made out of empty sandbags ripped open. He soaks this curtain in water and fires through it. The water prevents it catching fire and effectively screens the flare of the firing gun from the enemy. Sound is a valuable asset in locating a machine gun, but Tommy surmounts this obstacle by placing two machine guns about 100 to 150 yards apart. The gun on the right to cover with its fire, the sector of the left gun, and the gun on the left to cover that of the right gun. This makes their fire cross. They are fired simultaneously. By this method, it sounds like one gun firing and gives the Germans the impression that the gun is firing from a point midway between the guns which are actually firing, and they accordingly shell that particular spot. The machine gunners chuckle and say, Fritz is a brainy boy, not Alf he ain't. But the men in our lines at the spot being shelled curse Fritz for his ignorance and pass a few pert remarks down the line in reference to the machine gunners being windy and afraid to take their medicine. 